Welcome to Gaming as a Method for Jihadist Training, Methods of Communication. The agenda, what we're going to cover. We're going to take a look at traditional online training and the evolution of video games with respect to jihadists. We'll also take a quick look at Kuma Wars, a Syrian development group, and their development of Underash and some of the other uh, tools that they have developed, actually video games. We'll take a look at uh, traditional jihadist methods of communication and the uh, MMORPGs. We'll explain what that is as well. And we'll take a look at a cyber conversation, interesting conversation that uh, has been had and actually may have triggered some other activities on the internet. We'll decode the war planning scenario and we'll take a deeper dive into what is called DDS2 as well as Jacob Light and then we'll conclude this conversation. And that'll be it for today. Thank you. So online training. The, the uh, jihadists have actually evolved this over the years in many different areas, from uh, online uh, PDF files and videos, documents, Word files, uh, whether it's 39 ways to participate in jihad or 44 ways to support jihad, to methods of, of encryption, methods of how to uh, create cell phone detonation techniques, uh, ambushes, close combat, hand-to-hand -hand, uh, type of activities, IED creation, making, makings of PETN, or uh, explosive uh, activities, you name it, um, pretty much anything is out there, even how to set up a jihadist media organization. They have actually evolved right along with the evolution of the internet. Many of the things you see on the screen here today are actually documents collected by Treadstone 75, uh, 71 over the years relative to jihadist and Al-Qaeda type trainings uh, available on the internet through various forums and download facilities. They have continued to, to grow and evolve, as well as uh, modify 
where they're going with respect to online trainings as technology has been made available. If it's available to them, then they will actually use it and they'll create new content rich in media uh, relative to uh, their needs at the time. Uh, this is a, a recurring, recurring uh, a theme relative to this discussion today because as we start, we'll take a look at some of their early days and what they actually used. So the evolution of games with respect to video games is actually, as I mentioned, uh, standard flow with respect to what we've seen uh, is uh, American's Hell. This was actually a tool set that they uh, took and hacked and modified and tried to make it into a relatively fun video game. I'll make this game as well as the Quest for Bush available. There will be a link at the end where you actually you can go and download these games if you uh, so desire. Uh, these games, uh, as respect to, with respect to America's Hell, was actually a, a shooter type of game in the tradition of, uh, of just uh, the old style video games from, from the 80s, where you'd actually would shoot at an object flying overhead and uh, increase your score. They modified some of the uh, videos on it, as well as some of the content, and changed it into more of a jihadist video. Uh, originally, it was game, it was called Heavy Weapon. Heavy weapon, kind of a fun game. Again, you've got a device down the bottom and you're aiming at these aircraft overhead. They just applied their version of it uh, since they didn't have the skills to actually create their own, nor did they need to. It was able just to hack this current version. A relatively fun game, low skills. Heavy weapon is not really much with respect to propaganda, but it was one of their earliest attempts in actually uh, using video games to, to, uh, to get their message across. As you see here, that you could actually buy it for 1995 was Heavy Weapon, uh, the deluxe version. It also came with a download with cracks uh, and, and keys and key generators. You could actually open it up, and this is one of the ways that they actually modified this and turned it into what they call American's Hell. The next video game was more of a first-person shooter in the style of Doom. This was Quest for Bush. As you see in the video, you've got Zarqawi and Bin Laden, and you've also got uh, Bush and... Uh, Tony Blair, as well as the King of Jordan, and a uh, Shia leader uh, in the, the, the uh, form of a Ayatollah Khomeini. This game, uh, again, was modified and tweaked, and uh, images of Bush and his staff, as well as Shia leadership uh, from Iran, are all throughout the game as you try and get, reach Bush to, to jail him and take him uh, into custody. Uh, this, again, is much like a Doom game. This is a, a better effort. Uh, it's called Quest for Bush or Night of Bush Capturing. This is the second uh, video or uh, game that I will make available. Again, there will be a shared link to a Google Drive at the end where you can download these as zip files and uh, take a look if you so desire. Kuma Wars under Ash. Kuma Wars is a professional organization in Syria. They actually have uh, written and uh, sold several different reality games, Under Ash being one of those. You can go to kumawar.com if you want to take a look. These games are uh, much like uh, U.S.-made video games, only in the viewpoint uh, from uh, the Arab uh, side of the house with respect to anti-Israeli uh, uh, graphics and plot lines. Uh, Specialforce.net was one of the sites that they had, and uh, people would rate it. As you see here, that was talk walking through Beirut, the capital that defeated the greatest army in the world. I stopped by one of the computer game shops dispersed widely in Beirut and most Arab cities, and I saw the children playing the game of the invincible, invincible American hero. Bottom line here is they wanted to change that view, wanted to change it into an Arab Muslim fighting the Jews uh, as the Islamic resistance in, in Lebanon. Uh, and so, uh, Thus came uh, the birth of, of Kuma Wars out of Syria into creating videos where the Arab Muslim was seen as, as a hero against the West and against uh, the, the uh, Israeli state. Kuma War here, soon after uh, the death of bin Laden, they came out with a, a new module, a plug-in for the death of Osama bin Laden. As you can see, this was a downloaded game that you could actually download this or buy it in a shrink wrapper and on Windows devices. On the left, you see they've got World War II and Vietnam experiences and so on, as well as mobsters, dogfights, street soccer. So 
They are not just dedicated to writing games relative to uh, Middle Eastern uh, plot lines. But the um, majority of what they do write is relative to the Arab Muslim as a hero. Kuma's uh, War as well came out with uh, The Road Home Goes Through Kandahar, more of a Taliban type of uh, uh, video game about IEDs, rockets shooting down uh, drones or using drones. Um, this was actually an online game, as you can see the different servers available to you if you download the different packages with this. You can actually set up your own server, your own games, and, and run and, and maintain all your different games yourself. Uh, this could be very powerful if you wanted to actually track who was playing the games within your particular server area, uh, which actually, once you're inside these games, they're actually quite secure. But coming into it and using it could be uh, something that could be used as a, a tracking mechanism. Regardless, you can see some of the uh, the ideas here. Karbala, The Reckoning, Afghan MP, Sadr City MP, and some of the other games that have been made available within the Kumu War. This is actually a video under Ash, off car media, uh, with respect to Damascus. Let's take a look at their intro as they're trying to sell this one particular video game. Very interesting here as the uh, Israelis are definitely depicted as the aggressor. And uh, this is the intro that was one of the sales mechanisms for Underash from Afkar Media out of Damascus. <laughs> Jihadist traditional methods of communication in MMORPGs. Let's take a look here as we get into a specific individual as we talk about here. First, though, we'll take a look at jihadist methods of communication. Over the years, they've used IRC chat rooms. They've uh, used forums of, of the bulletin, uh, heavily used, still used today. Encryption, whether Mujahideen Secrets version 1 or 2, uh, different encryptors they have. They even have malware encryptors. They have encryptors for uh, pigeon with respect to IRC nowadays, as well as uh, a beta version of an encryption be used on, on Blackberries and mobile environment. They've used email dead, dead drops in the past where they've shared email user IDs and passwords and just uh, uh, created emails and saved them in a draft folder and never sent them. I've been in person, of course, uh, more and more as they've moved away from uh, electronic means, more cyber means, cell phones, couriers, flash drives, DVDs, um, and also uh, different methods that are fairly traditional of, of encryption uh, used over the years. This has been their, their, again, their traditional methods of communication. Also, of course, steganography has been used as well. What you see, too, is you have the massively multiplayer online role-playing games, or MMORPG. These games are actually uh, paid for free, sometimes uh, are for a fee, and sometimes they are free. You can find them online. Um, and these games are of all types of different genres. The critical thing here is that it's hard to know who's in them, who you're playing against. You can actually use different anonymizers to hide your IP before you go in to play these games. But these types of, uh, of sites are around the internet. You can pay a small fee to get in and start playing, and actually once you're inside, you can actually communicate uh, to one another inside the game. Again, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Email Van Veen here in a minute, and you'll see what he studied. Look 
at massively multiplayer online role-playing games. What he found over this time frame was very interesting. He found that terrorists could utilize these different games into uh, uh, a secure environment that could actually not be broken. This was an unbreakable code for intel agencies. They could get inside, they could start communicating, and if it was just run of one of their own games, it would be hard for anybody to know what was going on because the games are typically violent in nature, violent by design. So when someone is talking in a violent nature online in these games, uh, why would you think anything other than it is part of the game as opposed to uh, possibly uh, hidden messages within messages? Uh, and again, and access from anywhere, uh, and they can use the anonymous accounts to get in. It's very difficult to find out what's going inside these games. So for two years, uh, Emil studied these. He came up with uh, some great ideas of, about how actually jihadists, as well as anyone, could use these tool sets to reproduce real-world uh, dangerous activities. Like if someone who wants to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge could actually examine the target in detail and scout this in uh, his way in and out, as well as uh, uh, the same way you would with Google Streets. These tools have uh, very specific uh, geographic locations and designs based on what's been taken from real world photographs, videos, you name it. So uh, he found that these were, were primarily uh, great sites to actually conduct terrorist communication activities. So in his cyber conversation here, we can take a look at, at what he had, had put together, he being Emil Van Veen. Uh, he's actually written a book, um, MMORPG, that you can find online. I'll put some links here in a second. A very interesting book on, on uh, this. It's a novel, but uh, the narrative may have actually triggered the uh, alleged NSA in, in intrusion into World of War, Warcraft. So let's take a look. Again, this is a narrative, narrative as if you were actually inside of uh, World of Warcraft. And uh, this narrative was just a communication between two of the players. To look at trying to decode this actual war planning scenario and find out what did they actually mean? Was it actually part of the game? Or was this... Or... So you have the World of Warcraft map and the Zaram Strand and the Stone Talon Mountains, as mentioned in that narrative we just saw. Again, uh, Emil Van Veen's book. MMORPG that you can find online, Goodreads or on Amazon. It's fully available, great read. You should take a look at it. So now we've got uh, the Warmonger leading a big raiding party next Thursday. He continues a fun little romp through Stone Talon Mountains. Yes, but this time I want to hit the keep. Wow, he must have acquired the Dragonfire spell. Yes, last week in my inventory and raid a cast. Excellent, the time for the raid is 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Continue. The World of Warcraft map is actually an overlay of Washington, D.C. show you the photo in a second. We come in the southeast of Zaram Strand, clear out all the mobs. Then we keep the keep its, we attack the keep itself and use the spell. The article says that there are 110 gold and 234 silver inside. That's the real target. Talon 238 says 110, 234. Got it. Remember, 
Eliminate all castle guards patrolling the road to the keep and kill all our players in the area and then get clear. The Dragonfire spell will be coming through the south gates of the keep. No one will dance there for a hundred years after this spell is cast. So obviously Warmonger is actually running the show here. Talon is a split shoulder soldier following instructions. The Dragonfire spell could be a nuclear device. South gates of the keep, the keep here would be uh, the White House. The avenue approach, the attack vectors actually fit the map of World of Warcraft. Now this is just a fictional scenario, but when Emil wrote this out and actually presented this, this may have triggered some uh, reviews by uh, NSA to actually start taking a look at these particular devices. It may not, and it's going to be hard to know. Again, allegedly, allegedly done. But you see the avenue approach, removing any uh, of the mob uh, along the way, so we can have the attack vector, which is going to be straight on, this case from the south. Anyway, possible nuclear weapon or radiation weapon to go 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on that particular day, all in the environment and lingo of World of Warcraft. Now, the evolution of video games has moved from just uh, playing and role-playing to something of more real uh, uh, live training and real-world simulation. If you've ever been in the military, you know you always have simulated simulators to run games, but nowadays these are getting extremely every single uh, detail is just significantly uh, real. So in the past, we start again with Americans' Hell, jihadists using this. They had their various missions, mostly starting and focusing on Palestine. Uh, we moved to uh, then the quest for Bush, or Night of Bush Capturing, which again was a first-person doomed uh, type of game. Again, played most for, uh, uh, for uh, propaganda to to get them kind of excited about the whole idea, to, to prop them up, to charge them and, uh, and motivate them. Uh, now we've moved then as well into uh, Afkar Media from Kumar Wars, a development shop that continues today out of Damascus, Syria. And theirs were definitely targeted and one of the first ones out there to show that uh, uh, Arab Muslims uh, were the actual hero here against the West and the Israeli state. Now we start moving into Virtual Battle Simulation, or VBS, uh, from uh, Bohemia Interactive simulation, Simulations. And this is where you start to get into military grade and very solid and very uh, exciting uh, tool sets out there that are, are real. They follow uh, mission tactics, they follow mission verbiage and tool sets and the latest uh, methods, no matter what they are. We'll get into these a little bit more in detail. And then you also had again Jihad Jane, mobile warfare, kind of a low-end tool uh, gaming for you know, mobile devices. Uh, again, low-end, but the real simulation tool here is VBS2 from. So it's very serious gaming. The graphics are detailed. The street views are based on uh, actual terrain and geographic locations, uh, videotaped much like uh, again a Google Streets, so the detail is spot on. Also embedded the social cultural aspects of the location as well as religious aspects, linguistic, are all embedded into into these games for uh, realism. This combined with real military activities uh, creates a, a virtual gaming environment that uh, is quite moved from just gaming to now into serious training whether it's pre-mission or after action reviews. As you can see here, this is a street in Iraq and you've got uh, as much detail as possible as the way that location looks, even with tilting street lamps to the, the pavement and the cracks in it. Uh, it's very detailed, uh, boy with sweats and sandals, as well as uh, uh, the different writings on the sides of the, the White Humvee in the distance. Very detailed with respect to Bohemian Interactive. <clears throat> now, as you as you look at this too, you see some of the tools that you can do, you can use here, you can uh, embed, uh, you've got GPS and coordinates, you've got your watch and compass that you can set up, an actual uh, military style compass. The terrain is based on uh, local areas. You can actually embed different markers, IEDs, artillery strikes, that you can embed in a call for fire, you'd have to uh, execute per standard operating procedures. You could actually write yourself an operations order, issue a frago, uh, and actually go and execute your uh, your training 
through the use of Bohemia Interactive's BBS2, or BBS3 recently, yeah. Originally, this was supposed to be for NATO and NATO only. And as you can see, uh, I found that it's actually been uh, delivered out in Arabic as well and sold in the United Arab Emirates and the Gulf states as well as Saudi Arabia, from what I can ascertain. Uh, and again, you go back to uh, some of the, the translation here. The most particular that was interesting was relative to uh, crowds of stone when you're throwing uh, 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 stone throwing and angry use out there, much like the Arab Spring. So it could be used for a lot of different things, appealing to different government entities who may be involved in an Arab Spring type type activities at the time of this release. This was a 2010 uh, release of this particular simulation for Bohemia Interactive. They've got terrain editors based on actual locations, as I said. Uh, GPS receivers, sensors, cameras, uh, and access models uh, to evaluate what they see. Uh, they've got tracking capabilities. It is very effective. It is an, ex an excellent training tool. One of the problems, though, with is that, uh, well, before we get into the problems, we'll continue on. Bohemia Active Interactive, their mission, definitely create affordable simulation platform that provides vast, dynamic, high-fidelity virtual environments supported by a comprehensive suite of easy-to-use development tools, and they've done it. Pretty much anybody can download these types of tools, um, and, and actually there's a light version we'll talk about, and learn how to, uh, to script and write and create your own missions. And it's, uh, so they, they extend the computer game engines through adding functionality, content, and simulation hardware relevant to the training needs of military organizations. The problem is anybody can pretty much download these particular tools. Once they start making money off this, anybody wants to continue generating their revenue stream. And Bohemia Interactive has not done any different. So you've got VBS2 Virtual Training Kit, or the VTK. Uh, desktop application facilitates network tactical training and mission rehearsal. Evaluate scenario, includes scenario editors, a runtime virtual environment after action review and development suite for importing new content, such as terrain and different 3D models. So as new actual missions are run, you could actually uh, create the mission inside of VBS2. You could create the after action review of what actually occurred and learn from different scenarios that you might want to run. Even in the training before actually executing uh, the, uh, the mission, you could build the different scenarios based on actual terrain and, uh, and do the different scenario editors. Again, networked tactical training and mission rehearsal. This is not just a game. This is live, uh, actually, as you can get virtual training with uh, as much detail as possible. And they continue to hone this and build this out uh, as computing power. One of the problems that they've uh, talked about as in their sales model here is as they sell it to different organizations, you don't have, uh, you, you do have constrained resources and limited budgets out there. You've got limited training areas. You can't actually train in the areas you want to actually train in and not everything looks the same. Therefore, we can create a real live environment uh, in a virtual space that looks exactly like the terrain uh, that you would be operating in. We can actually make it more difficult uh, based on numbers of adversaries or opposition forces or op four. Uh, they could make the weather, rain, snow, sleet, uh, whatever is relative to that environment. So the realism is significant. Uh, and it can be just as deadly as uh, your troops are eliminated throughout the simulation. It's definitely a lot, expensive, a lot less expensive than deploying troops. It is a crawl, walk, run fashion relative to the old style uh, of, of, of sand table exercises. And with your after action review, you can really take a hard look at what happened and develop different scenarios. You can actually play this over and over again for others to learn from the mistakes of people who, boops, you know, who had boots on the ground during the actual live exercise. And again, uh, your training audience is definitely changing. Soldiers nowadays go home and play Xbox. Uh, and that has actually been something that has been changing over time. They're craving this type of, of, uh, of tool set. They love it. They want more of it. And uh, it's something that is critical for, to their learning curve. So the solution is definitely a simulation, but uh, there's been a gap between tactical training needs and what typical military simulation provides. I've actually been in military simulators for uh, M1 tanks, and they were they were okay, relatively limited, compared to what VBS2 now offers. 
Uh, I had actually taken these and used these back in the early 90s. Much has happened in that time frame. And nowadays, the simulations are just incredible. Back in, in the day, these were inflexible. They had to be done in warehouses inside these big boxes and had to have all kinds of computing power and people running them and managing them. Nowadays, you don't need specialized hardware. You can run it off of your PCs or servers. It doesn't take a whole lot. Matter of fact, you can run it networked across uh, the Internet if need be. And so it actually looks real. It feels real as opposed when it didn't. Uh, the languages are the same. Again, as I mentioned, social, cultural, linguistic, historical, uh, political, economic, social, technological, environmental, uh, and even in, in uh, industrial areas will look, smell, and feel the same with VBS2. So the evolution of a game engine, you know, started as entertainment, but you also you get into heavy military training. And you have definite enhancements for military organizations. Again, the crawl, walk, run, you can actually uh, create the, the uh, terrain that you're going to be on that looks and smells exactly the same. So when you actually get to that terrain, you know where the steps are. You know where that it goes up 10 feet here and there's a, a draw off to the left. Uh, it is very specific. It is very effective. Rapid terrain imports, uh, critical for mission rehearsal. You can import all these different terrains based on where you're going to go, as I mentioned. Uh, VBS2 recently bought a terrain organization a company out of the Pittsburgh area a couple years back and so now they own that feature as well and as they expand across the uh, uh, the globe they're actually a Czech company out of Prague. So from game to simulation uh, it really allows end users to, to author their own scenarios they can do it in a very short period of time with a little training the training is online you can download different manuals online uh, different help files embedded just like they're in a word uh, file it is a, a very effective uh, the after action review we're going to talk a little bit more here with some live scenarios and again it doesn't take long uh, train imports about one day or even less uh, based on uh, the writing of this one was 2010 so nowadays you'd imagine that the train import is significantly shorter uh, to do rapid development uh, definitely uh, an effective way now everybody uh, all adversaries as well as different Western governments have the resources to do the development uh, for VBS2 and VBS3. That was the intent, fast, interoperable, realistic. So in 2009, it was a de facto military simulation standard out there, U.S. Army, Australian uh, organizations, New Zealand, Marines, UK military, uh, Ministry of Defense, Special Forces out there as well. That are enterprise license for NATO, VBS2 Lite. Uh, this is actually Canadian forces, and this has grown industry users as well, as you see here, including Boeing and, and uh, Raytheon, who are involved in the acquisition and purchase of VBS2. Very effective tool set, spread rapidly, rapidly, a unique, so desired uh, by our adversaries. So, real world terrains, uh, scenarios, again, you can see you can put people in a, in a classroom setting, network together off of laptops. Uh, you can do mission rehearsal based on wherever you're going to be, whether it's the Baghdad Green Zone back in the day to Afghanistan uh, to uh, wherever your conflict. The United States Marine Corps funded the virtual toolkit, as we mentioned. It was started in 2007, completed in 2008. This allowed more of on the fly. Initially employed uh, to create videos showing how to correctly construct a military checkpoint, and it grew beyond that into something much more significant. 50 sites, tactical training, mission rehearsal, convoy training, uh, you name it, and it's gone well beyond that today. VBS3 is, is definitely uh, significantly further down the road with respect to effectiveness and uh, resource utilization for sim. So J-Cove Light, J -Cove available online. Ministry of Defense uh, and BIA created uh, J-Cove Lite to make it fully available out there. It's actually about a 2.3 gigabyte download, exploding to uh, between 6 and 7 gigabytes, which you can actually run on your desktop. The jcove-lite.co.uk site is no longer up, but you can find off of different torrents and different sites out there where J-Cove Lite is still fully available. As you can see, a great number of new missions have been added to this whether it's Oper uh, Operation Neptune Spear, which was uh, Bin Laden, to Operation Red Wing, 
this was actually a significant to uh, Lone Survivor. And all these different operations out there as well, uh, Search and Kill, Saber Co. 08, Tora Bora Patrols, uh, you name it, the Wrath of Allah. Uh, all these different actual uh, missions have been coded now into uh, JCO Blight and VBS2, so they're fully available, as well as after action reviews relative to those. You can download these and import them in as an add-on into these tool sets. When I went out and tried to find J. Copelight recently, I found that uh, really the last site recorded on the Wayback Machine or archive.org was February 11th, 2010. Although I think it was out there much beyond that. Regardless, it's gone now, but J. Copelight is still available. They have pulled it since probably because they realized that their adversaries were downloading this and using the same tool sets, using our technology and infrastructure against us, which has been pretty standard along the way. Here's the U.S. Army Lite, again, the JCO Lite. At the time, you could download it from a different download, download uh, from different sites out there. As you can see, it's about 2.3 gigs, runs on XP Vista Windows 7, 32 and 64 bit, uh, as well as uh, the, the game version that you can buy online. The requirements are relatively minimum, Pentium 4 at the time, 2.2 gigahertz, 1 gig of memory, 128 meg RAM. So uh, nowadays, it will definitely run on, on the machines we have the definite power. As you download uh, and use Jayco Flight, you can see February 3rd of 2010 when it was posted. And uh, there's a README here on the right. You can see the, the uh, location where you could actually uh, download the site. Is, again, is gone, jcove-light.co.uk. But it gives you a little README on, on how to actually explode this and run it. Some of the other sites now have, have actually come up relative to to uh, VBS2 like Arma and uh, all these different hosted sites out there. That's quite uh, an industry for using these types of tool sets. There's also a, a significant number of videos on YouTube relative to VBS2 and uh, Jayco Light. So let's take a look at Gunjgal. This was uh, a battle that occurred in Afghanistan in uh, September 8, 2009. There was uh, complaints that coalition casualties uh, were avoidable and caused by a failure of the chain of command to provide fire support for the team triggered an official investigation into Ganjgal. And as you can see here from the image, you can see the different release points, overwatch positions, as well as enemy forces in the red access roads, uh, access of advance where we had uh, coalition forces coming in. Uh, in the end, uh, Captain William Swenson and Marine Corporal Dakota Meyer uh, both received the Medal of Honor for their actions, uh, even though there were some discrepancies in reporting. But Ganj Gal was actually uh, used uh, as a, a mission review, an after-action review with VBS-2. And we'll show some of that in a second. So uh, the Army uh, Center for Army Lessons Learned has used VBS-2 to actually create a reenactment of the Ganj Gal uh, ambush. And what's available online is a version that uh, is the commander's version. It's about 17 and a half minutes long, and I'll provide a link to that. But you get an idea what the after action view can do. Now, if our adversaries have Jayco Blight, they in, in uh, turn can actually create their own after action review. They could do their own mission planning based on the terrain. They could actually take a look at how, to, how this actual ambush uh, didn't fully succeed as they wished their desire would, to be, would have been to kill all the Marines and Army involved instead of just the four Marines who died, uh, needlessly in this actual uh, ambush at the time because of, of some of the, uh, the problems they had with uh, call for fire and support. Regardless, uh, this has been uh, put out there as a uh, after action review and uh, the video and the follow through is, is pretty darn close to the interviews. These are screenshots actually taken from the VBS2 video. Again, here's a YouTube link to that uh, off of uh, uh, the uh, Center for Army Lessons Learned. It's been published on YouTube. This was actually portions of this were taken by 60 Minutes actually after they, as they interviewed Dakota Marr uh, to find out more about what happened there and uh, celebrate his winning of the Medal of Honor. Regardless, as you see, it's pretty detailed. You can see the, uh, the different forces in the blue that are coalition, different landing zones, medevac, medevac helicopter, the four Marines where they actually were found, uh, KIA, as well as the positions 
of uh, Taliban fighters in the Ganjgal uh, Valley area. And uh, you, you'll see as well that all these different videos have been posted online about the DBS-2, what is under, underwater navigation, uh, terrain training, leadership training. Uh, these are all online and, and relatively, relatively and fully available, excuse me, uh, for anyone to download uh, from a YouTube or view on a YouTube site. Uh, very powerful, but also powerful for adversaries. And there have been that may look like adversaries have been using uh, these tool sets. Regardless, here's a cut from 60 Minutes as they took uh, slides from the actual uh, the video from VBS2. Let's take a look. Again, that's Dakota Meyer. Those are just cuts from it. The uh, previous slide had the YouTube link where it takes you through the full 17 and a half minute commander's cut of the Ganjgal after action review. Now just uh, picture the fact that uh, Taliban- Four Marines were trapped in the village of Ganjgal after a patrol of nine Americans, both Marines and army soldiers, and 45 Afghan military was ambushed. Afterwards, the Army Center for Lessons Learned produced this animated recreation of what happened. The patrol set out for what was supposed to be a friendly meeting with village elders. Rocky terrain forced them to get out of their armored vehicles and move in on foot. As depicted in the Army animation, dead and wounded Afghan soldiers who had been part of the patrol lay scattered along the valley floor. Dead and wounded out of the valley and come back to run the gauntlet of fire again and again, still trying to get to the four Marines trapped in the village. And, de and developed for training. And we see that art definitely imitates life. Uh, this is more VBS2 type of activities here. And these are uh, things that uh, you can see follow directly to, to what uh, happens in real life. So let's start and play the, the imitation first, the animation, and I'll trigger the actual part way through. What you have is an actual, actual SEAL team and a Zodiac coming in and uh, uh, connecting with a, a Chinook helicopter, whether in real life or in VBS-2 simulation. <laughs> sand table exercise here from sand table to physical execution we'll see a Chinook firing countermeasures as well as a, a machine gun trying to take out a Chinook and we'll play these both at the same time
again, there's a lot of different functions and features you can add into this, but the realism is there, and it is actually being used by our adversary. Standing by. Standing by. Standing by. Need help capturing it. Going pretty slowly. Medic, heal at Good So who can get J-Code White? Pretty much anybody can get J-Code White. Uh, it's available out there if you want to search for it. There's a lot of different plugins. As a matter of fact, you may, in fact, be able to get to the BBS2 Fusion license, which requires a BBS uh, single license seat, $34,500 US. Uh, if you can't get it, someone might be able to get it for you. You can find a J-Code White is being advertised on different jihadist sites. And as you see here, the different links, not only jihadist sites, but online gaming sites. Uh, in uh, Arabic language. So it's fully available where you can actually download these, um, whether it's through a torrent or different sites, you can actually grab this. So it is being used. It definitely seen the value for it. Probably the reason why the Ministry of Defense pulled the J-Cove Light site and no longer makes it available, but it was too late. Like anything else on the internet, once it's there, it's there for uh, pretty much forever. Also, you've got different packs that you can input, like the Taliban pack, uh, different scenes and different actual execution of missions out there that uh, makes the realism. So with that said, the idea here is really that we continue to provide technology and infrastructure solutions to our adversaries. We make things available thinking that uh, no one is, is smart enough to understand that uh, they can actually download this and use it themselves. We don't play it through. We don't follow through our thought patterns. In the meantime, our technology falls in the hands of our adversaries, and they in turn use it against us. Attribution here at the top, as you see, uh, whether it's Dan uh, Ari, Emil Van Veen, CBS News 60 Minutes, BBS2, Bohemia Interactive, Upcar Media, the Center for Army Lessons Learned, and of course, various jihadis of questionable virtue. Thank you as well. And as you see here, there is a download link to American's Hell and Quest for Bush. I'll leave this on the screen. Uh, for about uh, one minute, and then I'll take it down, and you can grab this. Thanks for attending. Leave your comments here. Uh, as for other research you'd like to see, uh, this was just a, a, a brief rush uh, with respect to online gaming, and hopefully uh, you can benefit and learn from this. Thank you very much.